Hello, comrades and cadres. This is the Engels is speaking. Um, I would like to, before starting the stream, call attention to why I say the fourth position term um, was nebulous at its beginning, but also the actual history of uh, the fourth position term. The term fourth position uh, initially came from natives in 1944 who had uh, joined the US Army in fear of um, Nazis and in fear of fascism. And also, once they had exited the army, the fear of uh, America becoming fascist itself, which, to be fair, in its culture, it did become Naziist and almost a, a Fourth Reich in its own right. Although, you know, um, and and I won't, and I, I'm fine with like calling it a Fourth Reich in in the modern context with the way it destroys culture. Um, my next guest is a serious street cadre, and he is under my protection. There will be no dogpiling or slander. Um, but I am excited to finally, after so long, bring on Comrade Nat. Greetings. Introduce yourself, Nat. Uh, I'm Comrade Nat, uh, clerk of public relations for the Bundes movement, and the former Jewish Bundes diaspora movement. Um, I'm now a part time member, I guess, of uh, MRN. Um, yeah. Wasn't my intention, but I have a serious respect for Jason Unger. Yeah. Um, so, how about we just get this started? So, uh, the most complicated question of them all: How did you come to the left? Yeah, that is the most complication because that didn't happen overnight. Um, but it, but it, it, it was always there, I guess. Um, I think. Um, well, I wasn't born in the U.S. I was brought to the U.S. Uh, as a baby, and. Um, you know, bureaucratic paperwork and just coming to see like, it basically there's the narrative of America being the best place in the world. And then there's the reality, which not only doesn't me measure up with that, it tends to be the opposite to what they're saying it is. And, you know, um, uh, being raised a certain way and seeing things come about a certain way, it, it uh, I mean, it's a lot, you know, um, Realizing that religious, uh, for instance, a religious protest against the Zionist state of Israel is not enough and we need a political avenue kind of pushed me in there. So I actually started off center, center left, and then I was pushed very far left, like to the fringes of far left, some would say, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you want to see how far left I went, because um, it's not enough what, what people do. They like... I've always had contentions with the communist views, but not necessarily the essence of what communists are aiming for. So like Frederick Danson had a lot to do with that. But I, even though I was a student of Frederick Danson, the, 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 the first one to coin, coin the term Demarchism, uh, I didn't necessarily soak it in until later, until I saw that what he talked about met real ground practices in ways that, you know, anarchists and Marxists don't. Yeah, and um, it would also, to explain the fourth position, the, the idea of that, because the term fourth position predates demarchism as a term. And um, not only was it the fear of fascism, but it was the, the apathetic nature of uh, anarchists and Marxists at the time, which particularly took on that term, the opposition to um, fascism, um, communism, and, um, and um, obviously capitalism in general. Um, so that's sort of where that term uh, originates. Um, I've actually, um, I made a symbol, you may have seen it on my last video, um, Nasser Gaddafi and Dr. Weisfeld. Um, they are considered the three faces of the fourth position um, in terms of public figures who would represent what, you know, what um, the fourth position is. Well, I mean, I, I should probably <clears throat> dive into the essence of what what it means when i mean there's what there's what the there's what the far right means when they say for positionism or fourth way politics um and then there's what demarchists mean when they say it and unfortunately what whenever like this is why a lot of demarchists stop using the term um and i'm kind of divided on whether the term should still be used or not i i i would hold the term a lot because it's 
easily just misconstrued with Dugan, but like the in essence, the point of the fourth position is that there is something systemically wrong with Marxism and anarchism. And the way the thing that I think I should explain something because a lot of people like when they hear this term demarchist, which is a very repressed concept, even the term is repressed. Um, but demarchism basically views that socialism and socialist action is actually organic in humanity to begin with. And that the way that it's quantified by anarchism and Marxism is largely incorrect. Not 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 in everything because it, it, it gets complicated. Because if you get into um, the structure of the state, anarchism would be correct. But if you get into the structure of class, you know, which is related to the state, um, Marxism would kind of be more correct. Well, it, I mean, it would be. But the the um, the other thing is is that one of the big things that uh, uh, Demarchists did as it evolved is that uh, they would take concepts that were thrown away that made more sense. So the so I'm not sure how fourth positionism was picked up. Many people say that that was Dion Gibbs doing. I mean, he definitely pushed that, but that really didn't start with Dion. That actually started uh, the way its usage starts with the non-alignment movement. The problem with the non-alignment movement is it wasn't uh, just one. Thing. Unfortunately, you had fascists in the non-alignment of it. You also had social democrats, but you also had revolutionary socialists. And they probably would have gone, to be honest, more in the communist direction if at the time the communists weren't like completely hypocritical. And that, by the way, to, to clarify to MLs and MLMs, I'm not bashing, you know, Ma Mao, Stalin, or Lenin when I say that, because like that's a separate topic. Um, but fourth positionism is the way it is, is because um, it, in the Demarchist context, because there's no difference between secularism and capitalism. And the problem with saying that is if you if you mention that, they think, oh, so you want theocracy, which is not true. Um, another thing that pushes the concept is that there's binary dualist views that people have about a lot of things that you shouldn't have a dualist view on. I mean, there are there are things when there are times when things are one. There's times when things are two. Times when things are three, four, five. Um, and you know, like, like you get into Marxist dialectics, it's largely true, but it's like it's not so much that it's even flawed; it's incomplete. You think it's only really true in the context of philosophy, or or po poli political philosophy, or philosophy in general. Uh, think what I'm. I'm. I'm I, I kind of rant. I, I didn't mean to, but I sort of ranted the answer before. So I mean, uh, re redefine the question or give it a context. Um, no, I did. I didn't ask a question. I just said, as far as I'm aware, as we've talked, you consider dialectics to be true in in philosophy, but yes. not necessarily yes. uh, outside of the context of philosophy. Yes. Yes. Um, um, I I think that there are things that cannot be empirically measured, and I think once you assume that thing, everything can be empirically measured it becomes dangerous. Um, but I also think that if you avoid that empiricism, that's also dangerous. It's like, when is empiricism necessary? And where is, forgive the shortening of it, but when is art necessary? And I, I think that the loss of what art is for um, pushes people either into um, empiricism to the point where there's no creativity or basically innovation and thinking outside the box, or it leads to just completely fantastic views. Now, um, your, yeah, your position isn't theocracy. So if you could explain the world transcendentalist position um, okay, to, so, to the viewers. Yeah, world transcendentalism um, takes the historical view that theocracy actually is more or less a good thing, but that theocracy is impossible to implement. And even the kind of desirable theocracy that some Demarchists would like, they wouldn't agree with that either because all right, if we're being real, the only theocracy that could be acceptable would be a Sikh theocracy. The problem with that is that the Sikhs take their own religion seriously. It'd be more of an interfaith theocracy, therefore not a theocracy at all. But it wouldn't really be secularism. You, you see what I mean? So, like, theocracy is impossible to implement. And if it was possible to implement, it could be only done on the grounds that there's mass education, which there's not anywhere in the world. And the people who represent those positions would be the ones holding those offices. And again, um, why? Because if there's mass education, people would just uh, uh, have religiosity, you know, unrestricted in, you know, an organic process. So theocracy is impossible or, uh, to, to implement. 
And it is, by the way, like, I, I really appreciate that video you did, because it is completely incompatible with uh, fascism, actually. Because fascism, the, the thing that people get confused with, fascism typically requires, a, 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 um, like, a divine leader, but that doesn't make it theocracy, you know? Like, for instance, if the Jains had a um, government that was theocracy, uh, I'm not sure if they did or not. I mean, like, I, I should brush up on that uh, historically, but let's say they did. There'd be no divine figure to that. Uh, that's why um, if there's a religion that's called non-theist, not atheist, non-theist, meaning just rejection of the divine, it's Jainism. But um, that's different from atheist, because atheist is more than just a rejection of the divine. And then that gets another thing about how, how the, all this works is that um, there's nothing wrong with being an atheist or agnostic, but atheism not just new atheism, atheism is problematic because there's an ism meaning a practice. That's what ism refers to as like practice. So if you're practicing no godism, you know, that, that could be, that, that's actually a position of bigotry. And I get that argument from Frederick Danson. That's, but, and to everybody who saw the previous video, when he talks about the, 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 the gay homosexual Catholic, his name was Frederick Danson. Yeah. And uh, he, he was an atheist and he rejected atheism, but he was very staunch about being an atheist. He didn't believe in miracles. Uh, the divine or any of that but he believed in religiosity as a matter of orientation and he compared it to his homosexuality also being an orientation also what you're trying to phrase is, is sort of that the Denmark being a continuing of the non-alignment movement is sort of a continuity and rupture in the same way that maoism is a continuity and rupture of um marxism y yes and in fact actually that's a, that's another confusing fact there um Demarchy is not related to anarchy and Denmark is not related to, to Anarch. Um, I apologize, I'm not the greatest like uh, anarchist historian, but like I'm only aware of those holding the uh, commune of anarchy theory. And the way they, for instance, describe, at, describe it is that there's direct democracy, which is the goal. But the way that they break down democracy is different from how Denmark is break. Well, that's the same goal that, the, that the Denmark has had, but there's a difference with them. Um, and again, I'm, I apologize to everybody that I'm only really going by the commune of anarchy position. Um, the way that they see it is that the direct, there's direct democracy and it has um, a political government, which you would refer to that as anarchy, and, the, and then you would have a uh, political economy and you would refer to that as communism. Well, but so, so, so anarchy is, is government. Anarch refers to a transitional process with anarchists at least if you go with the coming of anarchy. I know that other anarchists in the poor referred to it as, as a chosen leader, a, temp, a provisional temporary chosen leader or something. So it's been used in different ways. But I would say if, you, if you're dialectical about it, the, the coming of anarchy's definition of an anarch would be more accurate. Now, the Demarch, okay, the Demarch is just five people, and they don't write anymore because they want um, they would want any further writings to be done by the truly repressed. So the Demarch is Frederick Danson, Herbert, who is dead now, he died of AIDS virus. Um, Frederick Danson, Herbert Dillon, Marcus Dinjamal, Shabazz Dinjamal, and Azam Abdul Hakim. That's a Denmark. Denmark E actually refers to the political action of the now. That's what Denmark is. So, like when we say, a lot of us will say, we declare Denmark E. And what that means is we're declaring um, action in the now, which is kind of funny because before we were friends with the anarchists, we were really bitter rivals and they said ah well fascism was always referred to as action so you must be fascist and they consistently try to gaslight us and in the beginning and it's funny that people think that demarchism is a form of anarchism in the beginning demarchists and anarchists were extremely bitter towards each other it was only when herbert dillon started um meeting consistent anarchists and finding how ethical a lot of positions and then ever since then we've actually been relatively close yeah if you've ever read some of those early demarchist writings it's um it's not pretty to say the least, um, but uh, I've had the I've had the pleasure myself. To be They're fair, also not pretty for Maoists, uh, but but to be know. fair, Frederick Danson and Herbert Dillon would would write about this later. Frederick Danson didn't know anything about what anarchism was. Uh, he just dealt with I would just call fake anarchists. Um, and, and Herbert Dillon, while he wasn't the most generous to anarchists, he was more fair to who they were. Uh, and he's the one that really got Demarchists to understand anarchists. And while it's true. As starting from Frederick Danson, that it's like said, yes, Demarchism is actually an antithesis to Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. It also requires respect to Marxist, Leninist, Maoists, because those are the only communists that would actually 
properly take up a revolution that could be acceptable. But I, I think that, now I don't personally believe this or agree with this. But the Demarchist position on Marxism is that the only sincere form of Marxism is actually Trotskyism. And if you know how Demarchism works, Trotskyism is no go. It's like like a nightmare. So the thing about liking MLM is that MLM is not accurate, and that's what makes it more better and more revolutionary. Um, and when I mean accurate, accurate to Marxism. And and again, I don't personally agree to, to that, but that's also because while I am a Demarchist, particularly Bundist, which is basically Jewish socialist, um, for lack of a better way of explaining it. But but um, my position is a bit different because I have strong Marxist-Leninist Maoist leanings. I'm not a Maoist, but I have strong leanings towards that because like a lot of Demarchist uh, stuff cleaned up its operations by paying attention to how Maoists handle things. Now, obviously, I have to disagree with the idea that uh, Maoism is sort of a betrayal of Marxism and that Trotskyism is the true Marxism or whatever uh, shit like that, but I, I do. So we have a similar sort of position, although opposite, um, with with my democratic leanings and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not I, fool. I don't like you have democratic leanings, but you know. Yeah, I'm not. A, I'm not a democratist. I do believe in you know mass lie and protracted people law or everything like that. Brainwashing you into Maoism. It's hilarious to me. Like, don't fucking say that. Fucking. <laughs> I'm like, are you fucking... kidding me, man? Like, like. <laughs> Anyway, how was the Satmar in the in the NYC? Oh, um, well, that was largely where my actual Jewish upbringing uh, started. Like, I, I was born from a Jewish mother, uh, and I preface this all the time because people don't know what Jewish is. Typically, you either convert to Orthodox Judaism that makes you Jewish, or your mother's Jewish. Um, so, while I'm a Sephardi. I was raised more around an Ashkenazi uh, uh, atmosphere um, starting from the age of 10 when I was brought to New York City because I, I actually started here in Arizona when I was 10. There was some problems and my uncle, who was my legal guardian, moved me to New York City um, and I had a foster parent that took care of me, I guess you could say, or, or, or something like that. And yeah, she was a foster mother, actually. That's kind of what she was. Um, the problem is I didn't see her very much she'd have like food ready for me and with a note in the morning and at night and i was required to spend most of my time in williamsburg brooklyn which was very difficult and i got lost consistently i had you know because like out here it's it's a grid where you know it's you have central and then you have uh 7th street 7th avenue you can navigate off that grid that's not how new york city is that's not how brooklyn is and um i got lost consistently i got into a lot of trouble um, there were certain rabbis that would hit me upside the head. Um, they couldn't do much because there's there's rules about dealing with, with what's considered an orphan. While I was an orphan, my mother was never my legal guardian. Um, and my father, that's a that's a whole different can of worms right there. But like I, I picked up some Yiddish. I, I'm not fluent in it, but I picked up certain things. Um, if anybody remembers that, I am... It, it, and a lot of them don't like to go on the internet and TV. In fact, that's a, that's a thing that I noticed is most people didn't have televisions over there because it's considered evil. And while the internet would help people understand their struggles, the majority of them to this day are told by their leaders not to utilize the internet. And while I disagree with that position, I in dealing with the internet currently, I now understand why. Um, the internet is typically a cesspool if you don't know what's going on. Um, but like, I got into a lot of trouble, you know, like, uh, I don't want to get into graphic detail for you because it's not something I would like, think, yeah, I don't want people like, uh, uh, like trying to copy that and not that they would, but like anybody could be influenced by anything. But like, I, I got into consistent trouble, but, uh, shout out to Rabbi Kravitz if he's still alive. Um, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have taken Judaism seriously without that, uh, that Satmar rabbi. And it was Satmar that I was largely around. Although I always admired Nateria Karta more, and I still am that way. And in fact, in the Bundist movement, while I was the one that pushed it, everybody had come to the same conclusion, including Dr. Weisfeld and Donna Newman, that the leaders of our generation have to be um, uh, uh, Nateria Karta, because we all come from the, what they call the ultra-Orthodox, whether we like that or not. So we have to determine who the leaders of our generation are, not to mention we have contentions with their with with how they do things, and it's better if they debate us or repeal pull on the grounds of Torah than Gentiles 
that don't give a shit about where they're coming from. Um, but like Brooklyn molded me largely. It, it's not it's not the full sum of where I come from, but like I, I it's hard to say whether I love Brooklyn or hate Brooklyn. I mean, I I, I kind of love it, but I don't want to go back to New York City. I mean, after 9-11, that's one of the things that really pushed me because um, when when 9-11 happened, um, and, and a lot of people don't know this, um, and I think it's because of poor memory, and, and it was a, more than 20 years ago now. Uh, well, no, it, it's been, it still would be about 20 years. It hasn't had the 21st anniversary yet, but, but there was, the asbestos was everywhere you went. And the smog that came up from the towers, that remained for like a year and a half, actually. And people developed extreme Islamophobic sentiment. And while I get it that people died in the in this trade center, and I understand that people are upset by that, I am a lot more um, traumatized by the Islamophobia, especially because when my uncle told me that, you know what you're upset with when you're hearing all this Islamophobic rhetoric? You're upset because that's what everybody sounded like on on the eve of the destruction of the Weimar Republic with the Hitler's uh, seizing of the country. Everything they said about us, the Jewish people, that's what they're saying about the Muslims right now. And I started realizing that there was an extreme correspondence between Islamophobia and Judeophobia, and that that both of that is anti-Semitism actually. And so, like, I know that I'm backtracking what I said, but to me, that had a lot to do with what brought me into the left. But it's also what what made me protective of religiosity because i've noticed in my experience while you can have an ill religious person um that means somebody without religion that could be very ethical not in large numbers without religiosity the world falls apart now there are questions to be asked about abrahamic uh religion concerning homosexual stuff and those are very valid questions um but I don't see secular humanism doing anything but causing indifference and like and, and, and I, I'm I'm especially very recently more wedded to the concept that secularism and, and capitalism are the same thing because they don't you know people speak of freedom of religion but nobody speaks of coexistence of long-standing religions which I find disturbing you know because what is freedom free domination maybe you know so you can make up Scientology and Mormonism and by the way I, I can't tolerate Mormons because and people say that makes you intolerant, except Mormons are inherently fascist. They really are. So, next question. Yeah, no, not much to uh, not much to disagree with. Um, I will say um, I did want to just touch upon uh, a point about the Islamophobia after nine eleven, um, and sort of the ideas about like the, America as a fourth Reich, or if you wanted to phrase it like that. Okay. Uh, especially the Bush Nazi family connection, and mm -hmm. I also wanted to touch upon the idea that we've talked about in private that America, if Russia is a prison state of nations, then America is a a death camp of nations, so to speak. Yeah. Which, if you could expand upon a little more. Well, America has gotten all this migration because of the way it advertises itself. Um, it's a, it's the place of the, of, of, of the broken dream. And, you know, I'm much more into the idea of, of waking that up and, you know, in the most traumatizing way. And I'm not saying I want to traumatize people, but after you've been traumatized and you realize that there's a collective indifference, um, you do kind of get jaded towards, like I am jaded towards the average American. I, I can't lie to you about that. Um, I have met Roma. I've met Bosnians, um, several indigenous people, black people, um, Byzantine Catholics. You know, you know, I'm really friendly with Byzantine Catholics. Which, by the way, while I would that 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 I would consider a national group, actually. Uh, but that's a, that's a whole separate topic, and and just as there's a lot of people that we we try to tell ourselves we're not a national group, but a lot of Byzantine Catholics have a similar issue. They are a national group, but a lot of them are in denial about that, and and that gets into another thing is is that Stalin did not define nation properly. He didn't because a nation is a culture plus, and this is the only empirical way to understand nation. And this is why Denmark people have contentions, for instance, with Denmarkism because we did define nation. There is no other definition than this. It's a culture plus. 
which is either bound by ethnicity, culture, religiosity, course, culture, or there you got an actual folk nation when it's when you're all three. Um, so not only is this the death camp of nations, it's a death camp of nations that aren't recognized as having their nationality. And then not really nations are called nations at times. So this is um, a, melt, a melting pot of assimilation and cultural genocide. That's what this country is. Um, yeah, and, and, and I don't even always bring up the natives as that example. I've also brought up um, Creole and Cajun culture and the way that it was uh, ostracized in the school system. And that isn't necessarily a culture that even threatens America as an institution, but no. they feel the need to assimilate it. I think that that's another thing that should be pointed out. There can be no debate around things like Cajun, Appalachians, uh, uh, you know, which that's what redneck is. Redneck is actually, I, I appreciate you bringing it up. I think Jason had brought that up before too. Um, redneck is a term for Appalachian communists. So the Appalachians, that's what, that's, the Appalachians are, that's culture. Uh, the Appalachian, you know, the pe those people, um, Appalachia, uh, the Cajuns, Creole, Qu Cape of Quab, the Quebec, that's all culture. That is not national. It's only culture. Now, funny enough, Quebec and Appalachia, that could become national. Um, but they have to, but they would have to tie it into ethnicity. And to explain ethnicity, a lot of people are like, oh, so you're substituting race. You know, people, you, you've dealt with this before, this, 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 this circle jerk of how people act. But actually, ethnicity refers yeah. to familiar connection, uh, at common ancestry. I mean, it can be homogeneous, but it, but it doesn't start that way to begin with. So like, it's more like a family line. Yeah. I, I like to drop the term homogeneous because the more it's used in that context, the more eugenicists try to use it. And I have a serious problem with eugenicists, uh, especially communists who are eugenicists. That's one of the reasons why I get along with their homeboy Stone Soviet. Uh, we, we share that contention towards this. Um, but yeah. um, I, I, my ADHD, like, uh, like what, what question are we on? Because I, 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 I prepped myself as definitely um, mean that. We, we uh on to the next question which is asking how you met dr weisfeld and um oh, you're like that, to get the guy that is hilarious actually how that actually happened i learned about dr weisfeld from other people i learned about him through my uncle who seriously admired him donna newman who um i don't give a fuck i'm gonna oust her uh she was she is just as much a prodigy of frederick danson as myself and comrade Sy. Um, so yeah, Donna, I don't actually care about you and I will want to say that publicly, your old news. Um, I'm being reactionary if I don't say that publicly. That He's out. putting it very lightly. If you know the, uh, if you know the Donna Newman situation, you'd know he's putting it very lightly. I mean, yeah, yeah. Her, um, her contributions are essential. Everything she did for the Bundes movement cannot be removed. I, I even fight for those positions sometimes against Dr. Weisfeld. But since 2021, she absolutely has no use to us. And by us, I mean the Jewish people. She has no use left, except whatever testimonies she wants to get disowned as she had requested. Um, but uh, Frederick Danson was the one I heard the most about Dr. Evan Weisfeld from. He wrote entire sections of, of literature about Dr. Weisfeld, how essentially it was. He also said that that, that like there's a, this other Bundist, I don't really remember that well, um, who was considered the last Bundist as he was living and even after he died. And Frederick Danson had contentions with that, he said, because he was always saying no, because to say that if someone is Bundist, they have to still be carrying out Bundism and only Dr. Weisfeld hits this. And he was worried that Dr. Weisfeld wouldn't have enough Bundist praxis, which did turn out to be the case, although not initially. I mean, he would try to implement concepts of the boon, but but Bundism getting popular again is way more of a recent phenomenon. And I can't take full credit for that. A lot of it had to do with Donna Newman. Um, and today it has a lot to do with Jewish anarchists and Jewish Maoists that are just taking it from Denmarkism, which is nice because then Bundism rise. But it's the ideologically, it's only Denmarkism that safeguards such an idea. And I, I, I don't think Denmarkism will survive, unfortunately. Um, because people mock uh, its problematic origins, the fact that it would pick up ideas and put it in because it would. The point with Denmarkism is that it takes stuff that's true that Marxists and, an, that Marxists and anarchists tend to reject. And um, Dr. Weisfeld is very like-minded in that area. Um, I've had heated debates with him before. I've had 
I've, uh, but more than I've had heated debates with him, um, I've had uh, productive debates with him. And now, and more than that, I've had extreme uh, discussions about theory, praxis, and, and me and him are actually very similar. You know, I mean, like we, what we are aiming for is the exact same thing. You know, national cultural autonomy, direct democracy, constituent assemblies, like uh, me and him kind of vibe the same way with, with that stuff particularly. And when I first uh, came in contact with Dr. Weissel, I, I called him on the phone, which Donna Newman is too much of a coward to do herself. Uh, and um, I'm not slandering her. I'm distancing her behavior from what has, from the rest of us. Um, but uh, I talked to him on the phone. And uh, right before that, I actually went to a Yahoo group that said, Dr. Weisfeld in here, here. It was like uh, Jewish, not Zionist. And it was a Yahoo group. And I contacted him. Um, and he gave me his phone number. I'm like, yes, he just gave me his phone number. I called him. <laughs> and, you know, like, uh, uh, I remember the early period of when I was talking to him. Like, I, I didn't want to overwhelm him with, like, you know, there's all these people that want to talk to you and everything like that. Although I did try to convey that over the years um but he was always very busy because he made it his mission to show that there are jewish people that will not only stand with the palestinians but will sleep in the same areas with them and will uh, oppose uh israel at the same exact level and he has done that and that's why in the bundes movie he's referred to as the chairman of the revolution because even when disagreeing with him we, we all still every bundes that is serious about bundism even you know even ones that I'm still meeting, they all know who he is. He's essential. He's like the linchpin to this. And if there's a Jewish gem market, it would be me, Donna Newman, Dr. Weisfeld. Like, if there's an exclusively Jewish uh, gem market. Um, mm. None now, of this is about him. Now, I would, um, I would like to say that, yeah, there, are, there are public books and there are public records of Dr. Weisfeld's books you can check out. Um, I, I'd recommend doing so if you want to educate yourself more on democracy and particularly Bundism. Um, but um, since I kind of talked about Dugan stealing the fourth position in the last video, how about we um, skip forward to pan-Europeanism versus Eurasianism as a concept um, and, the, and the, 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 that, that sort of thing? Well, technically, we're carrying out a sort of pan-Europeanism right now, like um, you're European, I'm European. You know, I'm not full European, but I'm I'm mostly. No, obviously you're Jewish as well. We have dual sort of identity, but. Well, yeah, yes, yes. Of course, Jewish is not an ethnicity, and and I'm Sephardi, but Sephardi, Ashkenazi, and Mizrahi—that's not Jewish itself. That those groups are predominantly Jewish, uh, and that's a very important factor here. Like the, um, Europeans don't have to hate themselves, but we should hold ourselves accountable for being the primary problem on the face of the planet. Uh, we, ha we have to oppose the white shit that we put on ourselves because the whole white thing was something that we've... Whiteness is an alliance of Europeans through nepotism. And that nepotism, you know, like you hear people say, it's okay to be white or all lives matter, but that, that's racist as soon as you hear that because whiteness itself is racism. That's what it is. And yes, blackness is completely justified because, you know, like I've said that you've heard me say the rant about this, even like 500 years um, ongoing of stealing people from Africa. Um, I mean, maybe it's more like 400 years, but like not 500 years ago, but 400 years of those 500 years being stolen consistently and being cut off from Africa, this new African nation has emerged. Uh, and it is the to me, it's one of the primary contradictions in the first world. And so like, that's why I, I have to support black nationalism by default. And pan-Europeanism becomes necessary because, um, you know, you're Irish, I'm Jewish European, and you know, you and I have, a, we, you and I just can't go with the white thing. We've talked about, that's one of the reasons why we connect so well. We can't go with the white thing because it doesn't, I've never saw myself as white. In no. fact, in fact, in fact okay. white tend to hate me a lot as soon as, you know, I give myself away when I burn in the sun, I'm like, ah, oh, he's Arab. Now, obviously, um, this doesn't excuse. This doesn't mean that any of us don't have white privilege. Now, that's a, a separate thing. Well, um, anyone who has this pigmentation to any degree has white privilege, and any of yeah. us, they otherwise are full of shit. Now, now that now that doesn't mean I that doesn't mean that we should identify ourselves as white. That is reactionary. Just, just because of privilege doesn't mean we need to buy into that privilege. 
And um, I'd like to expand a little bit about pan-Europeanism, the idea that, you know, um, the, especially in the American context, identifying as America is identifying as white and thus identifying as a, as a Roman citizen almost um, in, in that sort of way. It's, it's quite similar. Um, the idea that you are either you are American or you are some sort of, um, you know, person holding on to some backwards culture, especially in an American American context. That's how it's seen. And the truth is, is that like that extrapolation away from the actual like family ties, as we talked about in ethnicity, is a deviation for supremacy. Indeed. Um, I, and I just realized, and I wasn't trying to, trying to interrupt you, um, the, 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 um, one thing that should be noticed, uh, it, known is that um, there's, there's also Back to Europe, which is related, but it's not quite the same thing. And those, I would say that if you're serious about revolutionary pan-Europeanism and not um, the white people trying to take the dialectic before they were corrected, that, that's another thing about the fourth position, I just should say, is that... Uh, those that subscribe to that theory believe that third positionists dialectically will figure out the correct word before second position this was because second positionists are just lazy communists and fascists have evil on the brain and so they have to do that they have to come up with dialectical words and so it gaslights communists into not being better communists um and i do agree with that although like i said fourth position is a word that i'm torn on i'm not so sure we should keep that term but um getting back into it back to europe is not something that's forced. It's something that's meant to become popular and it can become popular, especially among, among poor European U European settlers. You'll, a lot of them, they, they, there's nothing here for, for them. And I look forward to seeing more poverty amongst the European populations here because they will want the same thing that I want and that's to go back. And the only thing that keeps me here is obligation to other people. Um, but pan-Europeanism is just like that pan, all Europeans, coming together and, 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 and recognizing the differences in nationality, but also solidifying a conversation um, that we're European, we're different nationalities, and we should stop colonizing the planet because that's what whiteness has, is about. It is we colonize ourselves and then we colonize the whole planet. And there needs to be an accountability. But I'm not saying like mass punishment, but there needs to be an accountability. But it's time, part of it is, is if we are to truly take care of ourselves, we should, but part of that taking care of it is to back the fuck off of Africans and Asians. You know. Yeah, the the re it's it's kind of a reconciliation of the crimes of Christendom as well. Uh, yes. a, re a, a reconciliation of like what Europe actually did to a lot of these countries, um, and the the thing it's brought upon the world, and it's sort of a it's sort of an internal decolonializing of. Europe, because and because Europe has, there are parts of Europe that are colonialized. You know, like we shouldn't paint Europe with uh, all of a broad brush. Not every country, you know, was, um, you know, England, Russia, or stuff like that. But the there is an issue of like the internals of one, what Europe did, and two, how it, its culture cultivated this white arrogance so to speak um and and also i did just want to touch upon um the idea of quote-unquote pan-americanism which is absolutely disgusting in the context of uh, north america and canada it is a little more forgivable in a south american context although according to net bolivarianism is much more popular now uh, than pan-americanism is in the modern context Although there are still some Pan Americans in uh, South America who I'm not necessarily going to judge for that. Um, it is way more popular. <laughs> um, it's not the end all be all to all South America, that's for sure. But like, um, it is more popular, and it should be. The, the issue, however, surrounding that though, is that it needs more of a concrete basis. Um, and as much as I love Hugo Chavez, he absolutely failed to bring that concrete basis. In fact, I would say that he left the door open for Trotsky to, to further screw it up than they already did. Um, and, and again, I'm actually rather pro-Chavez, but I can't ignore where Chavez completely fouled up shit. 
Um, but um, Eurasianism um, is is completely neo-colonial. Um, what it does is it, it is it takes it seems kind of funny how it takes light skinned Asians and brings them into the white world, uh, you know, and, you know, it, it seems like there's a growing block between Turkey, Russia and China, you know, um, I mean, I've had a hard time understanding China, to be honest with you, uh, cause you know, no offense, but like Maoists, you guys just like go against it all the time. At the same time, you know, when you investigate why you do, and I've had to like think about this a lot earlier this year, the more I look into why you guys have problems with China, the more I have to say, fuck, the mouths are correct again. Damn it. <laughs> Cause you're, but, 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 but the Eurasian thing is kind of like a new deal within, within the colonial and imperialist world. That's kind of what it is. It's, it's, it's a way of like bringing, you know, um, uh, as whiteness actually, you know, like is put into question and as white power throughout the world is put into question, uh, the reactionary sides of Asia start to rise. And, but they're not strong enough because they could worry, they have to worry about other things. So they, they form together in that flock. And I, I do, I love Russia. I will defend Russia's history. I'll defend the fact that it has probably the best free speech in the world and it has probably some of the best press in the world. But, it also has a very social hierarchy of transphobia, homophobia, all kinds of other problems. Um, Putin is a gangster. He is signed with Dugan, and Dugan is a fascist, un undeniably a fascist. And, and by the way, if you, if, if you know anything about PSFM, Dugan for a long time was the arch enemy and still largely is. Um, yeah, the the Eurasian, especially as well um, with some of Dugan's idea, the. Um, sort of almost a volkish idea of russian expansion you know like yeah, um yeah. the the vol volkish idea of, of greater russia Can I be which is, if it's okay if people keep asking where i stand with all that what can, can i can i can i bring up ukraine by the way here yeah so, yeah sure all right um and i'm only doing this because people keep asking my position or assuming my position um um and, and i start with this um I condemn Russia's actions, the Ukrainian state's actions, and NATO's actions. I am, however, sympathetic to Russia in this position, but not empathetic in. I don't support what they're doing, and in fact, I do condemn it. But I have empathy for where Russia is coming from and the Russian Ukrainians. Now, with that being said, as I propose them, what I actually support is an anarchist group in Russia known as Revdia. That's who I back in Ukraine. And I especially like the fact that they hate Eurasianism, and you should hate Eurasianism. It's racist. Yeah, the it's it's especially um, the idea because because like Dugan doesn't even talk about um, thinking fascism failed in the idea that fascism is a moral wrong or fascism is you know um, a system that will uh, fail itself. It's in the uh, well, it's it's in the idea that fascism has failed and there needs to be a new fascism or a new philosophy in line with. Or a modified fascism like it's it's not like he's a heideggerian as well if you read his literature which is uh suspect at best because of you know heidegger um isn't that what fascists always do though <laughs> well if you if you come out and say you're a fascist you end up like you know <laughs> you you end up in like the cultured thug circles and stuff like if like the thing is is that open i talked to him he at least he's open about it man he, he is but the thing is is you can't be as popular if you're an open fascist obviously online yeah online. being an open fascist online it, it, it boxes you into a camp like like a culture thug is in a camp you know it's very popular among white people of all classes out here yeah it's very popular in texas in fact i would say the texas state is officially fascist um i'm not trying to scare anybody who who's trying to stop fascism fascism is here um you yeah you also um who is abzan azam abdul hakim uh dylan spoke of him being uh metaphorical what 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 does that mean oh yeah it, actually it is my responsibility to explain that uh because a lot of the democrats the only reason why they're quiet is they want me to explain it which everybody wants me to explain shit i'm getting kind of frustrated with that but um, Azam Abdul-Hakim, okay, 
was originally a, a separate profile of Dion Gibbs. Uh, Dion Gibbs was complicated, and unfortunately, he ended his political uh, career in complete reactionary right-wing fascist trap. But Dion Gibbs basically built a persona. He had ghostwriters, because the idea of a Zam is a Zam. It's supposed to be basically an international man. All right. Um, and he would write it. And I didn't know that there was that, that Azam was Dion originally. Um, and neither did Herbert Dillon. Herbert Dillon immediately had endorsed the project of Azam that Bill came because it was a project uh, to um, inwardly decolonize, outwardly decolonize, end imperialism, end um, the imperialist project of globalism, um, and to um, bring the world to a real peace through reconcile reconciliation. All right. And I didn't realize that I had also been ghostwriting for Azam. And so had, her, so, so had, so had, uh, sorry, but so had Abdul Urshrad and Matthew Stephen. Although Matthew Stephen and Abdul Urshrad knew what they were doing. I only realized what I was doing later. And that's actually why I had left TSFM for a while because I, 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 I don't like that stuff. But, but, but then um, when Dion lost TSFM and they booted him out, um, there was all this literature attributed to Azam, and it was kept because there, because it, a lot of it worked so well in the praxis. So that's how Azam became the fifth part of the Denmark. Um, Azam is essential because Azam is the one that critiques Chavez and Gaddafi so much, and because like it, in PSFM, uh, it's narrowed down to like where the inspirations come from, but not where it ends. Um, uh, is uh, Nassar, Gaddafi. Chavez, and then technically Azam, you know. Um, so those are the those would be the four heads of patriotic socialism, basically actual patriotic socialism. Um, but Azam was essential because Azam was the one that critique uh, critiqued, and I, I I I don't know which ones built those critiques, but I know it wasn't Dion, because Dion was afraid of critiquing um, Gaddafi or Chavez. He was absolutely ter he was afraid of doing so because he because when people would ask him to. He'd be like, no, that's going to cause divisionship. But the Azam critique of uh, uh, Nassar, Gaddafi, and, and Chavez is what I agree with because it shows you where they had actually done monumental things, but where all this other crap uh, was wrong. For instance, it is Azam that basically said that what Chavez managed to do was decolonize Venezuela. But Chavez not being aggressively trying to push socialism means whoever comes after him will slowly bring back colonialism. And, and lo and behold, under Maduro, colonialism is returning to venezuela now i think it's also proof that we should never let an aristocrat ever ever again seize power in any way shape or form um because that's what happens even, even if they have like good ideas and he had a lot of good ideas and the ones that were implemented they worked but they but he he depended on an oil economy and stuff and see it's a zam that brought those critiques out and yes a zam not dion because dion may have started the zam thing but a zam became this big monster of a metaphor and you know I'm, it's my responsibility to explain that Azam was always technically a metaphor, but his writings are almost like like um like an archetypical person. So that's who Azam is. Um, I don't have the writings of Azam on hand. Those are actually being held by Abdul Urshrad, but um, I was told that eventually they'll get published. This is a, this is actually why I made the three faces of the fourth position image, um, because all of their literature is is public. You know, um, there's some literature of the um, heads of uh, Damaki and the uh, heads of uh, patriotic socialism that isn't out. Um, and when I say patriotic socialism, I am referring to the patriotic socialism of the of uh, PSFM and the Navajo Nation and not uh, the reactionary um, fucking <laughs> not the reactionary Nazbol shit that Caleb has been pushing. Um, because the only people who can be patriotic in America are those of the First Nations, as well as um, those uh, who have allegiances to New Africa and, um, you know, the Black Nation. As well as a few others, obviously, that I'm slipping my mind right now, unfortunately. You know what patriotic uh, socialism would mean in England? The IRA is correct. Yeah. <laughs> the IRA is very correct. Uh, I no, I shouldn't say that. I'll get kicked off of YouTube. Um, 
Um, no, no, I wasn't saying that. I was there was something I was about to say which was really bad. Um, <laughs> but um, unless there's anything else you want to talk about, I think uh, we can leave leave off. Um, I'd say um, never again, not just for the Jewish people, but for the for the, the Roma, for um, what has been done to the third world, what is still being done to the third world, what is being done to the First Nations, Native Americans, to the Palestinians, um, uh, to what is still happening in South Africa. And by the way, white people are not being replaced in South Africa. Um, you'll find that all that happened was a political removing of apartheid and not economic. And because of the lack of economic removal, all of the political measures of that apartheid that hurts black people is being rapidly restored actually right before our eyes and we're ignoring that never again for that as well never again for the armenian genocide never again for um the long walk which the navajos went through never again for the trail of tears which the cherokee went through and um for dr weisbaugh's parents um oh damn it <laughs> um what oh, they want um the horrors that my mother's family went through. Um, she died early this year. Yeah. Um, for the bombing of London, for Stalingrad, and what the Russians had to deal with. Um, and God bless the Russians for meeting, meeting the survivors at Auschwitz, along with the Red Army. America is a death camp of nations. Never again. Never again, partisan. Never again. See you, Cadres.